Lord Jesus Christ, beloved and eternal and faithful Son of the Father, Hamoshias Topatri, anointed of the Holy Spirit, incarnate, crucified, and ascended Lord of all creation, we believe in you. With great joy, with the praise of our whole hearts, we acknowledge and agree that you have found us in our darkness and sin, laid hold of us and taken us down in your death, freed us from sin and evil, quickened us with new life in your resurrection, and lifted us up into your Father's arms in your ascension and into the communion of the Holy Spirit. All of us and ours, every war-torn fragment, every fearful unbelieving, shame-riddled, broken part are in you, in your Father, in the Holy Spirit. We rest in you, Jesus, lover of our souls, our Savior, our salvation, our saving act, our King, our liberator, healer of our broken hearts, the author and finisher of our faith. You have included us in all that you are and have in your union and in your face-to-face communion with your Father. And you have included us in your anointing in the Holy Spirit. And you've included us in your victory over evil and wickedness and in your session at the Father's right hand above all rule and authority in heaven and on earth. Nothing can separate us from you, your Father and the Holy Spirit and the life you share together. Blessed be your great name, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to do in our time together what only you can do. In us, in Jesus' name, amen. John, the gospel writer, honors John the Baptist by giving him a place, a featured place in the first chapter, in the prologue and in the first chapter. And John is baptizing out in the wilderness, and there's this scene. And this is one of my favorite parts. It's rapidly become one of my favorite parts over the years, even in John's gospel. But there's this scene where the Pharisees, they sent the spies out to find out what on earth this whippersnapper that hadn't been to seminary, hadn't studied under any of the right people, is doing baptizing. Here's the scene. and This is the witness of John. It says, when the Jews, that's the establishment sent to him priests and Levites, this is verse 19 of chapter 1, from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? That is an accusation. Interesting, just as a side note, and there's no extra charge on this, uh, the first word of Jesus in John's gospel is not, who are you? It's when the disciples of John the Baptist follow After Jesus, after John had pointed out, there's the Lamb of God, behold. And they turn and follow him, and Jesus turns, and the first words in John's gospel are, what do you seek? What are you after? So, back to the scene in in the desert. And John confessed, and he did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? For the Lord knows we must answer the system. And they said to him, who are you, that we must give an answer to those who sent you? What do you say about yourself? And you can see them in their robe, religious elite, and the the pomposity and the smirks of disdain on their faces as they look at this guy that hadn't bathed and he's out there baptizing. What on earth is going on? What do you have to say about yourself? Who are you? Who are you? To even open your mouth. Who are you? Don't you know you're not one? You just said you weren't one of the great prophets. You're not Elijah and you're not the Messiah. Who are you then to be doing these things? This is the accusation of the Abelos. This is how he shuts us down. Who are you to open your mouth? You haven't been to seminary. You haven't been here. You haven't. Look at what you've done in your life. Look at your disasters and mistakes. Who are you to open your mouth? And John, I, just come on. He says, he says, I'll tell you who I am. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. The Lord. And they had been sent 
John says, from the Pharisees. And they ask him, and he said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you're not one of the prophets, and you're not Elijah, and you're not the Christ? And John answered, And I wish that when we finally meet John the Baptist, I'm going to ask him if he will show me the grin that was on his face when he stared these pompous brothers down right here in the desert. And this was his answer to them. This was his answer to the system that told him, you're not allowed to ask any questions. You're not allowed to open your mouth. You're not even allowed to have an interpretation of the scripture. You're supposed to, you know, John the Baptist is standing there and says, here it is. He says, I baptize with water, but among you now stands in your presence one whom you do not know. The Lord himself is among us. The cat, and you can see him grinning, is out of the bag. And the cat is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's here now, present, not absent. And you're going to know it. And I'm going to get to enjoy every single minute of your enlightenment. And you can see John saying, oh my goodness me, look at what's going on here. You came to shame me. I'm pointing out to you the Lord God himself in person in your midst and you in your religious confusion do not even know him. You can't even see him. His name is Jesus. He is the Father's eternal and beloved and faithful Son who is homoousios, topach of the same being as the Father and he's here with us and he is the one person in all of biblical history who has received the Holy Spirit as an abiding eternal gift the anointed one, and he is the Lord of all creation. And John, the gospel writer, is going to take this scene and he's going to develop it in his gospel. He's going to say, and this Jesus Christ, this Jesus who is the Father's eternal Son, who is face to face with the Father, this Jesus who is the faithful and beloved Son, this Jesus who is the anointed one in the Holy Spirit, this Jesus who is the Lord and victor over all creation is in you and in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we're going to see this. We're going to see this. Jesus prophesied in John chapter 14 in the upper room. He said to his disciples, I know you are scared to death. I know how big the system is. I know how fearful it is. But I'm going to tell you, I am prophesying, you will come to know when the Holy Spirit comes. You will come to know. You're going to see this, and you're going to know this, and you're going to get to live from this. Jesus says, you're going to see that I am in my Father, and that you are in me, and I am in you, and I did this. The system didn't do it, and it cannot take it away. I did this, Jesus says. I made my way inside of your darkness. I included you in me, and I'm telling you to agree with me about yourself right now. This is who we are. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to see it. In fact, if you turn to Acts 7, the first martyr of the church got to see it first. It is a striking scene. Stephen has preached his last sermon. He has been stoned to death. And it says, but being full of the Holy Spirit... And I can tell you, what is impressive about the Holy Spirit is not signs and wonders. What is impressive about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit knows how to help you see Jesus Christ inside of your own darkness. That is the greatest miracle in all of creation. As the Holy Spirit helps us discover that Jesus is not up there, out there. He's in us. And he did that. And you are to count on that. Listen to this. Now when they heard this, this is the same group that was after John the Baptist. They were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now what then is the glory of God? He defines it. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In fact, the Greek text is not at the right hand. The Greek text is out of the center of the being of the Father. 
That's the phrase in the prayer, Hamusias Topatri, that's right in the center of the Nicene Creed, of the same being. You're going to see that Jesus is not simply at the Father's right hand. He's in the Father, and the Father's in him. And he says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man, the Son of Man at the right hand, out of the being, out of the right hand of God. John, uh, Stephen got to see it first. Jesus prophesied that we would see it, the disciples would see it, because it's the truth of all truths, the gospel. And listen to me. The gospel is not the news. Contrary to what you and I have heard most of our lives, the gospel is not the news that we can receive Jesus Christ into our lives. The gospel is the news that Jesus Christ has received us into his life. He did that. That's what you bank on. He did it. It's not about you finding your way to Jesus. He's found you. And once you see this, the kaleidoscope in your mind turns and your brain is fried and out comes a thousand questions. Welcome to my world. Jesus, John is leading us to see in his gospel and starts with this, well he starts at the beginning, but in this scene to help us to realize that Jesus has made his way inside of us and we're going to see it. And that means, and this is what he says, I get this question a lot from people. In verse 12 of John 1, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even though who believe in his name. Which is a bad translation, because what he's been saying in the first part of his gospel is that Jesus is the creator of everything. <laughs> And not one thing came into being apart from Jesus or exist apart from Jesus. And not only that, but Jesus came among us and his own people, his own Jewish people rejected him. He says, but those who see, the ones who begin to see, they get to live from a certain spot. And that certain spot is they get to live out of their being. Exousia, it's translated authority or right to become in most of our English translations. What John is saying is when you see who Jesus is and who you are in him, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit, you get to live from his I am, from his own being, out of your innermost being. You find him in your crap. And he's not ashamed to call you his brother or sister. And you find him there and you get to live from that. And that's what John the Baptist was standing in when he confronted the entire system and said, he's here, he's here now, and you can't see him, he's not going away. And he's going to find his way inside of your darkness, Pharisees, and inside of your darkness, broken hearted, shame riddled sinners. And we're going to see that Jesus Christ is the truth of all truth and we're going to get to live from his I am in us and his life that he has is going to be as much ours as it is his. Now, I don't know about you, but when you see this, it, when I, it, it's taken me 55 years to wrestle this through. I saw it as a little boy, but I couldn't believe it. You know, you can't believe it because no one else is talking about this. Who else is talking about this in the United States of America? Well, the good news is a whole lot of people have been talking about this for 2,000 years, starting right there with John. This is what the early church was about. People tell me, Baxter, you know, I don't, this is all new. It cannot be true. And I'm saying, let me tell you, I'm not saying anything new. I'm not the modern person here. I'm the traditionalist. I'm the one standing with John the Baptist and the apostles and Irenaeus and Athanasius and, and, and Hillary and Gregory Nazianzus. Standing there, that is what they saw. That is what took their breath away. They discovered Jesus Christ not simply up there, but in here. And the one who is in here is the Father, Son, and the one who is anointed in the Holy Spirit. When you see this, a bunch of questions start bubbling up. Some of us do the what about shuffle. You know, what about this verse? What about that verse? What about this verse? What about that verse? This is not a question. It is a declaration. It's not an invitation. It is a divine human fact. Jesus Christ has made his way inside of us. When we see that or we begin to suspect it, we begin to maybe believe a little bit of it, questions come up. My first question, well, who is this Jesus then that has included me in his life? Who is this Jesus? What kind of life does he have? I want to know what kind of life I've been included in. 
Second question. How did Jesus do that? How did Jesus make his way inside of you and inside of your darkness and inside of your sin and inside of your iniquity? How did he do that? How did he include you and me and the human race in his relationship with his father and in his relationship or in his anointing in the Holy Spirit? One day we're going to see that we're included in Jesus' anointing in the Holy Spirit and we're going to believe it and we're going to get to live in it. And it will be a whole lot more to it than speaking in tongues, my friend. The Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life. And he or she is a person, not a power. And she loves communion and she loves fellowship. And we're going to get to know her as Jesus knows her. Know however you want to say it, him or her, this, both are biblical. Second question, how did Jesus include me in the world? Third question, what does this inclusion mean for you, for me, for our relationships? If I'm included in Jesus and my black brothers and sisters are included in Jesus, there is a whole new view of ism there. There's a whole new view of what it means to be a woman and a man if we're both in Jesus, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit. This is where the whole world begins to change. Now we have a platform, a place to stand, not intellectually, but internally within us where we begin to know who we are and we know who everybody else is. Now we have something to say to everyone everywhere. Let me tell you who you are. You are my brother. Not in some liberal 19th century fatherhood of God and generic brotherhood of man, but in Jesus. He is the one that has included us. And he's done this. What are the implications for the way we treat people who are different than we are? What are the implications for the way we treat one another in marriage? How does this deal, how does this help us understand our hardships, the struggles, the tragedies of our lives? That's another huge question. The fourth question, and this is where I want to spend some time this morning. The fourth question is, Jesus, if you have included me, in you and in your life with the Father. And if you've included me in your anointing in the Holy Spirit, and if you've included the human race, why are our lives still such a mess? Now, for years and years and years, I allowed the evil one to point out my mess and use as proof that therefore I wasn't in Jesus and Jesus wasn't in me. Back to accusation and shame. He would point out my, my faults. He would point out my weaknesses. He would point out my sins, whatever. And use that to say, therefore, this cannot be true. When in fact, the declaration that Jesus is in you and you're in him, and there's a mess in your life, tells you something else. It tells you that the mess is not from Jesus. And the mess is not from you in Jesus. So what is the origin of the mess? And how do we get rid of it? How do we find real, actual healing in our lives, in our ongoing relationships, in our own inner world? Let me read to you a story or a verse from Revelation that describes another version of the Nativity story. Those of you that are taking notes of Revelation 12. Verse 4, or I'll start with verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were the seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of the heaven and threw them into earth. And listen to this. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. Now, that's the other story of the birth of Jesus. There's no wise men in this part of the story. This is the invisibles. This is what you don't see in Matthew and in the gospel stories in the nativity scene where you have the shepherds and you have the angels singing and the wise men coming and you have the animals. In the book of Revelation, John is stripping back and saying this is something else going on here. And he's saying this, I think, to the church in... Um, 
in his time and to us. And what he's trying to say to us is the mess. The mess does not have its origin in you. It does not have its origin in Jesus Christ or in the Father or in the Holy Spirit. It has its origin in the dragon or the serpent. And I particularly like this. The word for serpent in Greek is ophis. (laughs) Ophis. And Lord Jesus, in your name and by your authority, we simply together right now bind ophis and all his minions from this room and from our hearts and from our memories. And we don't want to hear from anyone here but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All other voices are silenced in the name of Jesus. We have an enemy who is a coward. He preys on babies. He kneels down waiting for the birth of Jesus so he can destroy Jesus. And the text says that Mary and Jesus are whisked away and protected, of course, by Jesus' Father. That picture, for me, helps me understand why there are at least two Baxters. There's the Baxter that gets to walk in in the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord. And then something happens in the invisibles, inside. And I become a different person. I've shut down. My world is full of pain. There's actually three Baxters. The third Baxter is what you think I am. And I don't care about that one anymore. (laughs) So now I'm dealing just with two. Perhaps you're different, but I suspect not. We have an enemy. He knows who we are better than we know who we are because we are, in fact, seated in Jesus Christ above all rule and authority in every name that is named, both in this age and the age to come, at the Father's right hand, which means in the Father, in the Holy Spirit. And the evil one, Diabolos, Ophis knows, if you and I get to know that, and we begin to live from that here simply, not, not just, I mean, from, as a matter of natural life, simply from here, he's toast. So his only gig, his only game is to figure out a way, how can I keep these good people who are in Jesus Christ and begin to even, believe, begin to even know anything about who they are? And one of his first lies, and I'm going to talk about this in greater length in a moment, but one of his first lies is the lie that we are separated from God. He can convince you that you're separated from God, then you're going to spend your life trying to figure out how to get back and never get to rest in the fact that Jesus found you and brought you home, and he did that. Two different worlds right there. So the evil one, I think what he does, is he crouches around the shadows of our early childhood, just like he was crouching there, waiting for Jesus to be born, Jesus calls him a liar, the father of lies, and a murderer from the beginning. Now this is this part of what I'm saying here is not designed to make you afraid. Because we don't have anything to fear. We're in Jesus, and he's in the Father, and we're in, 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 in the Holy Spirit. Nothing can separate us from the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But we can be confused, and we can actually act against the life that we have in Jesus. And that is what Diabolos does. He knows how to lie to us. And he sits around waiting for something to happen in our childhood. And then he is going to whisper his interpretation of what that means. And we are going to bite and agree with it. Now let me give you an illustration. My grandmother, who is now graduated to glory and I am sure is praying for me even in this moment. She was four foot ten. She used to say eleven, but and we called her Napoleon behind her back. Because she she was the matriarch of our family. She she loved education. And she is a very educated woman herself. And then when she was dying, she would have these lucid intervals where she would sit up in the bed and quote Shakespeare verbatim at length, theatrically. And I was like, wow. And then she'd quote the Psalter. And anyway, my grandmother loved, there's there's two of my brothers and my sister, and she was always determined that whatever we wanted to do educationally wise, we we would be able to have an opportunity to do it. So the day that I graduated from the University of Aberdeen, King's College, under J.B. Torrance, that night my grandmother found a way to call me on the phone. I don't know how on earth she knew how to do this. But she called me on the phone 
And she said, Baxter, I, when you're home next, I want you to bring me your Ph.D. degree. I want to see the certificate. And I said, well, Grandma, we're going to be home this summer. I'll bring it. So I brought it. And I took it down to her. And I went in to see her and my granddad. And I showed it to her. I unrolled it. And there it was. And she started crying. And she said, Baxter, this is one of the happiest days of my life. And I said, well, Grandma, thank you. I said, I couldn't, couldn't even begun to have done it without you. And she said, she said, I want to tell you something. She said, when you were a little boy, she said, you used to sit on the stairs, the back steps at the house. In my house that I grew up in and her house, the backyards met. Um, and she could look out her back, her kitchen window and see all the activity of the boys in the backyard. So she told me when you were a little boy, you would sit up on the steps in the back of the house right by yourself while the other little boys were playing in the yard. And she said, do you remember that? And I said, no. I remember making hand grenades out of magnolia you know, cones and, and, and building tree houses and, and blowing stuff up if we ever got any, any um, firecrackers or anything. And she said, nope, you would sit there right by yourself. And she said, almost every day. And she said, do you remember this? I said, no. And she said, well, and what, so she said, I want, I want to show you. So we walked from her house up to our back where I grew up, and we sat down on the steps. And she said, you would sit right here. And she said, one day I decided I had to figure out what you were thinking about. And so she said, I sat down with you, and we talked for a good spell, she said. And she said, do you remember that? And I said, Grandma, no, I don't remember that at all. And she said, well, finally, I stood up and I said, bless his heart, he's just dumb. <laughs> Every family has one. We're just going to have to take care of it. I don't remember that comment. I don't know that I actually heard it, but the message was delivered to a little boy. Bless your heart. You're just dumb. Now that is what you call a wound. I didn't know enough to know how to disagree with it. So when my older brother made straight A's, it proved the point to me that I was just dumb. And when I was the one in the family that could fix anything and take it apart and put it back together, then bless his heart, he's just dumb. He's just, you know, he's not like dad. He's not going to be a, a lawyer like dad or granddad or a doctor, all, you know, in the family. We had all these, you know. And that's, that was the message, one message, one little message. So much so that when I graduated with a 4.0 in seminary, I thought it was because the seminary was easy. Kid you not. Never crossed my mind that to go to study in Scotland. I, didn't, I never crossed my mind that I could do anything like that because that's not who I was. You see, it had formed my basic sense of who I was, that I'm not like my brothers. They're both smart. They're both brilliant lawyers. I'm not like my granddad. I'm not like my dad. I'm just dumb. So I'm going to have to find my way in another way. That was one wound. Crouching down, waiting for that to happen is Diabolos, and he whispers it, and I bit it. And it formed a basic self-impression that has taken me 55 years to fight through. And the answer for me was hearing Jesus say to me, Here, Baxter, I have given you my mind. We have been given the mind of Jesus. In fact, we've been given the wholeness of Jesus. We've been given the life of Jesus. We've been given the spirit of Jesus. We've been given relation with the Father. That's the answer is when we know it here. But we don't know we're knotted up. And we don't know how the, the evil one has taken these wounds in our early childhood and used them to form our basic way of looking at things. You see, someone who believes they're dumb when they make an A on a test, they cannot receive it. It's got to be because it was easier. There must have been a big curve. you know. Oh, plus, they never even expect to do well on anything academically. You can see, and part of the message, part of it is the wound for you and for me and for other people is, I think, custom designed to shut them down from doing what they're supposed to do in life. So if you're going to keep me from doing what God's called me to do, what's the best way to do it? Bless your heart, you're just dumb. Who are you? I'm dumb. 
Now there was another wound side by side with that. And that wound was no one has your back. Now you put those two things together and you see how Diabolos, that's the only thing he can do to us is lie to us and convince us that that's who we are. I'm on my own. No one has my back and bless my heart. I'm just dumb. Now there's others that come, family of wounds and things that happen to us. I, one lady told me the story. I was talking about this and she told me a story. She said, Baxter, she said, when I was a little girl, I was sexually abused in my family and my mother knew it and she didn't say a word. And she said, it was bad enough being abused, but the worst was that my mother said nothing. The interpretation, I'm unworthy of, I'm unworthy of my mother's care and protection and love. Now that stuff shapes deep. Another friend of mine told me a story when he was in, he grew up out west and uh, he was, his dad was plowing the field. And Caleb, have we got a screen we can use yet? I, I absolutely enjoy this. I'll wing it. He told me the story when he was about five or six years old. His dad was plowing behind a mule in the field. This was years ago. And he was, um, his dad whistled to his mom and, and did his finger like this, which meant bring me some tape. I need some tape for the blisters. So my friend said, and he's, he's in his 80s now, and he said, he said, Baxter, and when he told me this story, he was shaking. His hands were shaking. He had tears in his eyes. He said, Baxter, he said, he said, um, thank you. He said, Baxter, I grabbed the tape and I went running to my dad and I tore off a piece about seven inches thinking this is going to be great. I'm going to get to help my dad. And he said, by the time it got there, it was just a gnarled mess all in on itself like duct tape, you know. And he said, I walked out and I handed it to my dad and he said, my dad just looked at me with this gust. He said, I can close my eyes and see it right now. And he said, my dad put his hand on my head, turned me around, kicked me in the butt, knocked me to the ground. And I got up and he said, I peed in my pants and I cried all the way home. Now what's the message there? And it's, we all make mistakes with our children. We all, but that's not the issue. The issue is how the crouching lion is waiting for that so he can interpret it. And it carries weight with us. And that's all we know about ourselves. And it begins to shape us. We've all got those stories. We've all got those moments in our lives. But it's not the stories, it's not the wounds, it's the interpretation from the evil one that has to be addressed for us. And the only way to address that is to hear the living word of God who carries more weight than anything in the universe speak to you here inside. And anything less than that is not going to free you or free me. It may tell us, go look the part, Baxter. Here's how to dress and look like a preacher. Here's what you do if you're Presbyterian. Here's what you do if you're charismatic. Here's what, you can go sign up somewhere to tell you, people can tell you to look the part. But that's not healing the soul. That's not healing us internally. The only way that can happen is if we're able to meet Jesus inside of our own pain and brokenness. And the only way that can happen is if Jesus has already made his way inside. And we can't believe that until someone tells us Christ is in me and he did that. Now look for him. Ask him to reveal himself. You with me? Okay. Can I use a pencil on this or something? He's got me doing some kind of high tech stuff. That... This is the message. This is the message. This was the accusation coming from Diabolos to John the Baptist. Who are you to be baptizing anybody? Who are you? The message is to us, I am not. Which is the evil one's interpretation of himself. Jesus' message is, I am. The evil one believes he is, I am not. And he is going to whisper 
that to us in the context of our wounds and our lives, and we're going to believe it. And you can make a list. Everywhere I go around the world, I ask people, you tell me about your I am nots. What are they? It's the same list. I'm not important. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not there yet. Probably never will be. That's another one of mine, wherever there is. And even if you get there, you can't believe you're there. You can't enjoy being there. And you spend your life trying to get there, and you're already there in Jesus. That's where the church is going to be really embarrassed. We have spent our lives trying to create a kingdom that is already present. And the one we created is all that we can do. And what we want is the kingdom that only the Holy Spirit and the Father and Jesus can do. I remember once reading a book on the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and I kept, I was, I was disturbed. I couldn't figure out why I didn't like the book, and I couldn't figure it out. And I kept reading. Finally, some years later, it dawned on me that the guy had written a book on the fruit of the Spirit, telling me how I could produce the fruit myself. Here are the steps. I said, dude, don't you realize only the Holy Spirit can do this? You can't produce love. You can't produce joy. You can't produce goodness. Only the Holy Spirit can do that in you. And the Holy Spirit does that in you by by revealing Jesus in you in the midst of your mess. And you can begin to see yourself differently and let go of some things. And lo and behold, the fruit begins to to come forth. Last year, since I left here, um, I, I was involved in a program called Operation Restored Warrior over Four Eagle Ranch just outside of Vail. And while I was there, and I'll I'll share more about this later, but while I was there, I got a vision. And I realize now, looking back, that even when I was a boy growing up in the Presbyterian Church, that I got visions, but I didn't know to call them that, (laughs) because we didn't get visions in the Presbyterian Church. Um, We didn't. I mean, we, we didn't call them, you know. So I just thought it was me, imagination. But what it is, is the Lord gives you pictures. He gives you words. He gives you insights. He gives you nudges. But this vision I got was of a beaver dam. And it was so big, it could stop the Mississippi River. And down at the bottom of the beaver dam were these huge logs that were even bigger than the giant sequoias out on the west coast. Layered down at the bottom. And the river was being dammed up. And it was just a little trickle coming over here and a little trickle coming over there. And I said, Lord, what in the world is this? What is this? And he said, Baxter, the beaver dam is holding back the river of living water from flowing across the rest of Western world. I said, Lord, what is it? How did it get there? He said, those logs, those logs are agreements that my people, the theologians, the preachers, the people in the pew, they're agreements that my people have made with Diabolos about me and my father and the Holy Spirit and the human race. And it's blocking it all up. It's the I am nots. And and then I could see that it was not simply a huge beaver dam blocking up the river of living water, but there was a beaver dam inside of me. It was blocking the river inside of me because the river's already there. And Jesus says, you're going to, it's going to flow. But it flows when that beaver dam begins to be dismantled. And the beaver dam is made up of our agreements with I am nots. How how in the world is anybody going to stand up and speak in front of anyone anywhere in the world if they believe that they're dumb? It's only when you 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 begin to know the mind of Jesus that you have the freedom and confidence to begin to speak. These I am nots have been given to you early on. They become your way of seeing yourself. And they become your way of seeing others. It's the way you perceive yourself, the world. And worse, and more important, it becomes the way we see God. We see God through our own I am nots. And we create a deity in the image of our own I am nots. I am not worthy because God is some kind of deity who did a bad job creating us. And then once we fail, we became unworthy of his care. It makes sense, doesn't it? We've even defined holiness in the light of our I am nots. And come up with a non-biblical view of holiness, which is sort of a stainless steel moral thing. that God's up there inside a Listerine bottle, 
And he's looking at you and he's taking tabs. And if you're not that squeaky clean, you're toast. You're not going to get the blessing. You're not going to get his, his, uh, a share in his glory. We project. Athanasius in the early church called this mythology. In psychology, we call this projection. We project from our own beaver dams, our own I am nots, onto other people's faces, onto God's face. And we begin to see things that are not even really there. We begin to see proof that I'm not smart everywhere I look. I begin to see proof that no one's got my back everywhere I look. You begin to see proof that I'm not lovable, that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy, that you're not beautiful. Everywhere you look, you see it in people's faces. And it's not there. It's an illusion. But we, it makes perfect sense to us. And we make an, another agreement. Another log goes on the beaver dam. The river is dammed up even more. I am not worthy. I'm not special. I'm not good enough. I'm not included. I'm not saved. I have proof from my own life of these things. You have proof. You treasure them over in the corner of your soul. They're comfortable. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, we're going to deal with this because this is not free. You're not getting to live from my I am. You're living from Diabolos's I am not. I'm not special. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not going to make it. No one has my back. Fear grows within there. And when you see this, you begin to understand the story of the Bible. Because when you go back to Genesis, chapter 3, and you read what happens, it doesn't make any sense at all. And I want you to see this. Genesis chapter 3. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, or naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made they sewed figs leaves together and uh, made loin coverings and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden now if you're like me I've heard that story my whole life and I always figured the reason Adam and Eve hid is because they were guilty and they were afraid of being punished. They hid because right then and there in their act of disobedience, they got an interpretation from Diabolos and they dipped the paintbrush into their own little unfaithfulness and they painted the face of God on it that wasn't having anything to do with the way the Lord really was. They created a God that was a figment of their imagination you with me? It's not the Lord God walking with... It is now the angry God, the judge, whose fundamental, whose fundamental nature and character is a judge and he's watching you. That's what they created in their imagination. And once you see this, you begin to understand that the real problem that is being addressed all the way through the scriptures is not how can a holy God who dwells inside a Listerine bottle by himself here, who sits watching to see if anybody's going to be that perfect anywhere in the universe and get it right every time so he can let them in his place called heaven? Or how can this lonely God, who's alone, figure out a way to justify guilty sinners who are all deserved to burn in hell forever? That's not the problem in the Bible. The problem in the Bible is Adam and Eve now have on a pair of glasses that keeps them from seeing who God really is in any way. And even if they could, they wouldn't believe it. It's too simple. It's too good. It's too real. I want you to see this. Paul Young, Paul Young has done a lot of work on the, the first uh, four chapters of Genesis. And we've had some fascinating conversations. And um, what it actually says in the text. I want so it, You that have a Bible. Does anybody have a footnote in verse 8? Genesis 3a. Does anybody have a footnote? About the text. About what's in the, actually in the text. Nobody's got a footnote. 
All right, let me listen to, l- listen to this. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, there's a note by that word cool in my Bible. And it tells you what the Hebrew word is that's being translated cool of the day there. And you know what it is? It's ruach. And what does ruach mean? That's the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking at this text, and I thought, oh my goodness me. And you begin to realize, and just give me a minute to to go back. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word for God from Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Genesis 2-4 and then at different places beyond, that word G-O-D is Elohim in Hebrew and it is plural. Lord, Yahweh, is singular. God is plural. And no one knows what to do with this. And it's all through the first chapter. And that's why when it comes to verse 26, and it says, let us make humanity in our image. It makes perfect sense for those who are reading the Hebrew text, for those of us that's reading the English text. Wait a minute. Why does all of a sudden God, singular, one person, decide to make us, you know, use the phrase us and we. But in actual fact, it's all the way through there. And even in the Old Testament, and and you see this as you read um, in some of the Hebrew texts, for example, in um, Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Now, no one knows what to do with the fact that the word creator there is plural. Now, what is going on in this text is that the writer of Genesis has seen something that he can't even begin to talk about. It's like Isaiah. He says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It's not enough just to say holy, because he's talking about the Father, Son, and Spirit. He says, who who can I send? Who will go for us? And so what you have in this text is you have this, the, the writer understands that I don't know what this means, but somehow there is within God's being relationship. There is Yahweh, and then this reference to God's plural, there's some sort of relationality here. And then you've got the Spirit. And when you see that in this text, you begin to understand what the nature of the problem is running all the way through the Bible. Because the one that is being pushed away by Adam and Eve is not simply God, G-O-D. It is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me put it another way. Adam and Eve are on their uh, knees and their hands are in their faces. And a person comes over to to whisper to them that this is their interpretation of this is not right. That they're all wrong about their interpretation of what's going on here. And Adam and Eve push this person away. And as they push this person away, he turns and it is Jesus himself. The issue now, from Genesis 3 all the way through the book, is how on earth is the Father, Son, and Spirit going to get inside of your I am nots and communicate with you here who God really is and who you really are? It doesn't do any good to send us an external, inerrant word of God because you and I and the human race are going to misinterpret it every time based on our own internal critique and image of ourselves. Are you with me there? You see that? This is the battle that's going on all the way through the Old Testament. This is why Jesus says, This is eternal life. What is he, how does he define eternal life? John 17, 3. That they may know you, the only true God, Father, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now, why would Jesus define eternal life as knowing the Father? I thought eternal life was how long you live. How does what you know have anything to do with how long you live? Jesus is saying, listen, this is what life is. Life is when you are able to turn with me, in me, with my mind, and see my Father's face and see the way he looks at me and looks at you. That does something inside of your inner world that nothing in the universe can do. It produces a fountain. It produces a river. It begins to overflow, and that is eternal life. It just keeps going and keeps getting better and better and better and better. Jesus knows that and he says in his high priestly prayer, this is eternal life that they may know you. And then in Matthew's gospel, he says, and this is 
shocking because he's standing within Israel at the time. And he says, no one knows the Son but the Father. Neither does anyone know the Father but the Son. Matthew 11, 27 is Jesus' interpretation of what happened, I believe, in Genesis 3. This is not a legal problem. The issue in Genesis 3 is not, my father created you and you botched it and he's pissed. And somebody's got to do something to get him straightened out or this is going to be obliterated. That's not the issue. The issue is we no longer have the capacity at all to know Jesus' father. And even if we could see him, we could not believe it because of what we have already concluded about ourselves. And we have made ourselves the judge. And if it doesn't make sense to me, it cannot be true. So how on earth is God, the Father, Son, and Spirit going to get inside of your darkness and mine and find a way to communicate with us so that we can begin to agree with him and live from that agreement? How on earth is that going to happen? It's not enough just to send a book because we're going to misinterpret it as we're doing right this very moment. In our day, we're misinterpreting the book that was given to us. It's not about intellectual information. It's about coming to know something in the depth of our being. But how on earth is this ever going to happen? This is eternal life, that they may be face to face with you, Father, as I am, and know you and know your heart and live from that. Oh, they don't know you. Here is the problem. They rejected the Father, Son, and Spirit in Genesis 3. So you have the same issue in Genesis 3 that you have in you and me. Adam and Eve built the beaver dam. It became their pair of glasses. They're looking at the Father, Son, and Spirit, and they're thinking this being is a judge and is coming after me, and I'm guilty, and I'm not coming out of the bushes. There is no way I'm coming out of the bushes to meet that thing because that thing is a bigger version of me, and I'm fickle, and I'm unfaithful, and I botched it, and there's a hair trigger on that thing. So I'm not coming out. I'm hiding in the bushes from the greatest friend in the universe, the greatest philanthropist in the universe, and they believed they were right. They believed they were sane to hide from this Father, Son, and Spirit. Now that's the problem of the fall. It's about the fallen mind. And the perpetual factory of idols, as Calvin said, that we create with our minds and we impose that on the Father. And nothing the Father says is going to get around that. It doesn't matter how much he blesses us. All we see is his anger and his frustration and how we failed because we're not smart enough. We're not important. We're not good. We bought the lie and it's now interpreting God's very being and nature for us. This is a huge problem. It starts there in Genesis and it runs all the way through the book. And what you see when you read the Bible from this perspective is you see the heart of the Father, Son, and Spirit trying to find a way to get inside and begin a conversation. So the clothing. What does God, the Father, Son, and Spirit do with Adam and Eve when they are so shame-riddled and guilt-riddled and embarrassed? They're not coming out. They think God is against them. They think that the fundamental character of God is way less than our earthly fathers and mothers. Because you don't require your children to confess their sins perfectly before you will forgive them. You want them to know your forgiveness and your love. And we, being, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children. But now we've got a situation where if the father approaches Adam and Eve, they're going deeper in the woods. And they're not coming out. So what is he going to do? And it's the most beautiful scene, one of the most beautiful scenes in the Bible. What does he do? He says, okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get where you are in your darkness. I know what you think of me. I'm not like that. But that's the way you think of me. So I'm going to meet you in your darkness right here. I'm going to kill an animal and I'm going to clothe you for your conscience sake. So you will at least be able to have a little bit of a conversation with me. I know other than that, you're not even going to come out. And I know that you're going to interpret this act of me killing the animal to clothe you as somehow me needing to be appeased. But we're going to do this. And then you have this scene with with Abraham on Mount Moriah. Abraham or Abram was from Ur of the Chaldees, which was pagan. And the Father, Son, and Spirit say, we've got to start somewhere, so let's start with a real bona fide pagan. Let's start with somebody who has no clue whatsoever what's going on. Oh, there's a dude in Ur of the Chaldees. And as Paul uh, Young said one time, he's a moon worshiper. Um, they had all their idols, all their gods and goddesses. You see now a little bit about why no matter what 
what um, tradition you go back to, the same God and gods appear everywhere, angry. They're not for you. They're against you. If you're going to get your crops blessed and your children protected, you've got to do something to get this God turned favorably towards you. Every religion in the world is like this. It's written because it's coming right out of our own brokenness. Whispered by Diabolos, written large in our minds and painted across the cosmos. And religion after religion after religion and high priest and guru after guru rises in the midst of that and says, here's how to go forward. Here's how to go forward. Here's how to go forward. And ism after ism after ism arises within that in order to get God off our backs. So God says, okay, I'm going to call Abram and I'm going to bless him and I'm going to be with him and I'm going to use him to bless the entire cosmos. And I'm going to call Abram and I think, you think about this (laughs) Abram hears God say, hears the Lord say, Abram, follow me. Leave your, leave your, your world of comfort. Leave everything you've ever known in your entire life and come with me. He doesn't see God. It's to me, uh, it parallels to me when Miriam, Mary, hears the angel speak. And says, oh, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm not married, I've never had sex, and I'm going to be pregnant, and this, this, I'm supposed to be able just to believe this? Like, you know, what's everybody going to think? I mean, what was Abraham thinking? He hears God call him, says, leave your, your people, come and bring and follow me. Who are you? Where are we going? He doesn't have a clue. He thinks it's just one of these gods up there that's going to zap him if he doesn't do exactly what he wants to do. So as the story unfolds, You come to this scene on Mount Moriah where God says, I want you to take now your son, your only son, and I want you to go up on the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him. Everyone in the world of Adam, the fallen world of Adam, reads that like, here it is. God really is alone and angry and inside the antiseptic bottle, the Listerine bottle, and we failed and he's angry, but he's going to give Abraham a chance if Abraham is willing to be obedient and sacrifice his own son. Because that's what you do. You throw your children into a volcano. You kill your firstborn to to Molech so that that there can be a little bit of peace and we can get some rain around here and some crops can grow and we can eat. And these other tribes will settle down. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So Abraham goes, and in that moment when he's got the knife out, and I cannot fathom what he was going through, and I cannot fathom what Isaac was going through in that moment because it wasn't until he started down that God stopped Abraham. And he said in that moment, which was an existential crisis, I cannot imagine being in a more profound, grievous situation in my entire life than having my own son, my only son, on an altar and told by God to kill him. I mean, can you conceive of the, the, the existential pain of that? And he takes him into that moment and he stops him and he says to him, he says, now, now, Let me tell you who I am. I know you think that you need to appease me and that you need to offer your son to me, that you need to offer something to me. Abram, that's not how this works. My name that you've never known, but I now have a chance, an opportunity in your darkness to share with you, my name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Abraham, you got nothing to put on the table here, and that's cool. I got everything. I'm not like all the other gods and goddesses. And this is the struggle that you see all the way through the Old Testament. Israel, always wanting to be like the nations around them, always wanting to fit into the going theology of the day, to the nations around them, always wanting to have a king or have a priest to do, and God said, I'll be your king, I'll be your priest. But okay, if you're going to insist on this, I will set up a kingship for you. But it's not going to be good, but I will do this. And so you have this wrestling between God trying to find a way to get inside of darkness on the part of Israel, on the part his side to Israel, and Israel always trying to run. You think about Adam and Eve hid in the bushes. Israel can't run, hide in the bushes. They're in covenant relationship. God's closed the door and locked. They can't get away from him. This is why you see them always trying to get away because it's too much. They don't want this thing. Moses, you go up there. You just tell us what we got to do down here. You go up. Nobody wants to go up on that on that mountain. And God's desire was, I want them all to become priests. 
No, 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 because of the way they could see, the way they understood. This is the problem of the fall. This is the problem of um, your own journey and mine for me is that we have bought the lie of evil and in that has built this beaver dam which has become our pair of glasses and, and stopped up our ears. So the question is how in the world is, is the Father, Son, and Spirit going to get to the bottom of this? How does Jesus get inside of you and me? What you see when you start from this perspective, you begin to understand that God's strategy, the strategy of the Father, Son, and Spirit is to do the one thing that not one of us in all of creation would ever think God would do. We think God's coming with the angels with a 55-gallon drum or you know what. We think he's coming and he's going to rule and he's going to swipe away the earth. We think he's going to come in his anger and his righteousness and he's going to He's going to, to eliminate all of us who don't measure up to the Listerine bottle. I'm going to tell you. You know what the Father, Son, and Spirit did to get inside of your darkness and mine? They submitted themselves to us in our darkness. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is not about sinners in the hands of an angry God. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is about God in the hands of angry sinners. It's about Jesus saying, Papa, I'm going in and I'm going to let them pour out their wrath on me. I'm going to let them kill me. I am going to allow them to mock me and call me names and beat the you-know-what out of me and hang me on a cross and I'm going to suffer because I want all of their anger and all of their darkness and all of their pain and all of their confusion dumped onto me. And as they dump it onto me, I'm now inside. I'm now inside of everything that's wrong. And I'm inside everything that's wrong as the Father's beloved Son who lives face to face with His Father. I'm inside as the one anointed in the Holy Spirit. And and I am bringing my Father and the Holy Spirit with me inside their darkness. And I'm going to be able to talk to them then. Listen to this verse. John chapter 17, verse 26. Listen to this. The high priestly prayer. The last thing... Can you erase with this? Well, I wanted to leave the I in. What is clear? John 17, 26. Listen to this from the perspective of Jesus as the Father, Son, in the light of Adam's fall, in the light of them rejecting the Father, Son, and Spirit, in the light of all this conflict that goes on in Israel, listen to this. In the light of the Father, Son, He says, Father, I I have made Your name known to them. And I will make it known that the love with which You love Me may be in them and I in them. Listen to this. Father, I made it. I'm here. I've made it inside the darkness. I've made it inside the place where Diabolos has convinced them all about you. I've made it inside the place where they agreed with Diabolos and it's a stronghold. And I've made it, Father. I've made your name known to it. And I will make it known. That's the most beautiful word in the... Baxter. I will make my Father known to you. I take responsibility for you and your darkness. And I'm going to get inside of it. Father, I'm here. I did it. I did it. And I'm going to the cross and they're going to dump it all on me. And I'm going to go with it. I'm going to submit myself and all that I am to all of their anger and all of their pain and all of their confusion. And all of their I am nots. And let them vent their spleen on me and curse me and damn me and beat me. And in that way I am entering into their darkness in person Father, do you see this? I am going to find them in the dark and I will find a way to make contact with Adam and Eve in the bushes inside of their own being. Not outside, shouting instructions, but inside. You see it? I am submitting myself to them in their darkness in order that I can bring them to see who you really are, who I am, and who they are. And Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to see it. John the Baptist saw it. Cat side the bag. And the cat is the line of the tribe of Judah. And the cat's in your bag now. 
and you can't kill him again. And he brought his father and the Holy Spirit with him. If I didn't know that, I didn't know that Jesus was in you and in me and in every person on this planet, who would ever open their mouth to have a conversation about this? Because it would then mean that I have to figure out a way to convince you in your mind that what I'm saying is right. And then I have to find a way to convince you to keep convincing you that I'm right and you must come here or come to this conversation. But because Jesus has submitted himself to you and to me and to the human race and we damned him and we poured out our wrath upon him and he submitted himself to it and there he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him, there is inside of us Jesus himself and it's a tuning fork. And it goes off in the witness of the Holy Spirit inside of you and it messes with your brain because it does not fit in with what we've received in our darkness, in our conversation. It doesn't make sense to what we've received as a human race because we have tarred Papa's face with this and we've created all these religions in this way and Jesus comes along and says, Nope, Baxter, I am giving you my mind. Use it. I am telling you right now, repent. Which, as Francois loves to point out, is a a horrendous translation of the word metanoia. Baxter, change your mind. I'm here. Take sides with me now, right this moment. Take sides with me against the way you see my Father. Take sides with me against the way you see yourself right now. I'm here. Believe me. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you who you are. Let my I am resonate within you and live from that, not the I am nots. This is the heart of the gospel. The Son of the Father becomes what we are, submits himself to enter into our darkness, and he made it. He did it in the most astounding act of divine humility ever, ever conceived. And we can't see it. In fact, we argue with it. It can't be that simple. But I'm telling you, the cat is out of the bag. And the cat is the lion of the tribe of Jude. His name is Jesus. He is the Father's eternal and beloved and faithful Son who sits face to face with him before the all creation in the Holy Spirit as the Lord of all creation. He's inside of you and me and he's saying, now let me reconstruct your stinking thinking. You can't even do that. Let me do that for you. Let me share my faith and my faithfulness and my courage and my strength and my joy with you. Stop trying to manufacture a kingdom or some new word or some new thing and then spending all your days trying to convince everybody that this is the real deal. Live from me, from my I am inside, my exousia, my I am being, I, I am out of your innermost being. Rest. You cannot rest until you hear Jesus inside your own darkness. Then you know, and this is what John is, part of what John is saying when, he, when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You look at that verse and you think, man, there's, there's something wrong here. But it should say, behold, the scapegoat of God. You know, because it's not a lamb that takes away sin, it's a scapegoat. So I'm like, John, what are, you, what are you doing? Behold the lamb of God. Part of what he's doing is he's saying, I'm going to pick the image of a lamb because nobody takes a lamb seriously. A lamb is playful. A lamb's not too disturbed by things. Father, Son, and Spirit. This is costly for them, but they've never been afraid. They've never been, oh no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Look what the diablos... No, we're going in. The Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And when John says, behold, that's the key word. It's more important even than the Lamb um, <clears throat> of God who takes away the sin of the world. The word, behold, you, me, right now in our darkness... Right now in the thing that makes us ashamed, thing where most of us are afraid to even look like. John is saying, behold the lamb there. And you know what it happens when you behold Jesus in that world inside of your own brokenness? It takes away the sin. It takes away the unbelief. It takes away the heaviness. It takes away the damage. It, take, it begins to heal by beholding. That's all the way through the book of Revelation. Behold the lamb on the throne. It's in beholding. It's in seeing. It's in encountering. It's not in, okay, if I believe the right way, then God's got to do something. Or it's not the Harry Potter magic wand thing that that he gives me and I can wield this power now. It's in our beholding. And all we do to behold is to say, Jesus, there's a beaver dam inside of me that I can't even begin to figure out how to get rid of. Jesus, I can't make myself 
better. I can't produce Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith. I've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and I can't do it. And I'm sure not going to pretend that I have. I'm sure not going to hand on to my children the pretense that I have. Jesus, here I am. I'm in the dark. I can't see. I don't recognize the difference between light and darkness. I wouldn't know the difference between heaven and hell. Life and death. Jesus, you got to help me see. I want to see you. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus in me. And let me read one other passage and I'll stop for a while. Kind of. I always thought that Paul's I always thought that, the, that Saul of Tarsus' encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road was external. Like, when you read it in Acts, it reads like a bright light shines up there in the heaven somewhere. Saul sees it, it blinds his eyes, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? But when he narrates this scene in, his, in Galatians, I want you to see this. He says, But when God, the Father had set me apart even from my mother's womb, which in itself is an amazing statement, is it not? Because that includes Paul's Phariseeism. It includes the murder of Stephen. And we don't know what else. All of that's under the umbrella of being set apart from the mother's womb. We're set apart from our mother's womb. We belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit. We always have. We always will. God's taken all of the mess, every bit of it. And he says, Saul, uh, Paul says, when he, the Father, was pleased to reveal his Son in me. You see it? Even the NIV, which is the not included version. You see, you see, I mean, I know this. people don't want to hear this, but this is why we have different translations. Because you're going to read the story through your theology. And you're going to translate these passages through your own way of seeing. Thank God for Francois and Eugene Peterson and people that are seeing the truth. And they're like, oh man, Francois told me one time, he says, Baxter, the New Testament is screaming the union that you're proclaiming on every page. And it's been watered down and translated out. And he says, I'm translating it back in. <laughs> And the lion, the cat's out of the bag. But listen to this. He said, to reveal his son in me. The revelation was not external, but internal. Paul met the Lord Jesus inside of himself because he was already there. In the Pharisee, in the dude that had Stephen murdered. He's already in there. He's already in you and in me and everyone on the planet. And he is putting an end to our sin by bringing us to behold him, to see him, to encounter him, to know him. And then it says, it translates this, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. You know? So I went back the other day and looked in the text, in the Greek text, and it doesn't say among the Gentiles, people. It says, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him in the Gentiles. That's what he says. I see who Jesus is now and where he's come. And I'm going to tell you who you are and who he is. He has made his way inside of your darkness, inside of your sin, inside of your shame, inside of your pain. And he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. And he did it. And he's saying, take sides with me against the way you think about everything. Learn from me. Let me teach you who my Father really is. Baxter, take those silly glasses off. Learn from me. Let me tell you, show you who my father is and what he's really like. Because then you're going to get to live. And that life that you live knowing my father, that life you get to live is in fact abounding, overflowing life in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to take a break. I need a break. Let's take, how long, Caleb?